I'm Zoe Caridis, and tonight's story is about a friend of mine. John Paulson overcame early obstacles to succeed as an acclaimed actor, film director, and more recently, the director of some of the world's most popular TV dramas. He's recently been back in Australia for Tropfest, a short film festival that he created, and has since become the biggest event of its kind in the world. This is his revealing story. This is a fun scene. Yeah, this is the buckle, honey. What's your fingers? It's always been a very difficult business model, Trophus, you know? Thank you very much. It doesn't get easier because as it gets more known All right. and maybe even more attractive to sponsors and supporters, it also gets more expensive. Stand by to I know in 2000, we had a lot of trouble and I ended up writing to five friends, basically Nicole Kimmon and Tom Cruise, Lachlan Murdoch and Sarah Murdoch, and... Uh, Russell Crowe. Those guys basically just wrote a check and said, here you go. And, and here we are still today because of that. Tim, I mean, the other thing to think about, if there's, obviously they're sitting here. With Trophist, I do feel like we're, we're making this up as we go along, and that's kind of fun and challenging and, and really scary at the same time. So here we are, it's five days before the big, the big night. A um, little bit nervous. The weather is unbelievable, which always makes me even a little more nervous at this point because, I don't know, I just pray it's going to be a day like this on Sunday. Um, it's all looking good, though. Right now, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, it's probably the thing I feel like I've most contributed to the planet, which is a good feeling. When the film's getting close to being on, that judge has got to be sitting in their seat and focused yeah. on the movie. For me, all of the success of Tropfest and what was created was 100% John's doing. You know, I used to say to him, like, anything you touch turns to gold. Like, what is your secret? And, and I watched him do that with Tropfest. It's going to get people's attention and it's, it's going to give us a little buffer. He's given a lot of people, not unlike myself, that didn't necessarily grow up in Sydney with all the cool kids, the opportunity and the right to say, well, I can do something too. He is an inspiration. He's been an inspiration for me. He's been an inspiration for, you know, thousands of filmmakers in this country uh, and now around the world. We almost want Adam to do the countdown, the introduction, and then bang. I'd say he'd be one of the best connected uh, people in, in the Australian film industry, for sure. He, he, I mean, everyone, it knows him or, you know, they want to know him. <laughs> stop it. I won't stop it. Here I am, the young blood, going off to face my judgement on the knife edge of, uh, of life and death and you're off screwing the nearest pensioner. Serge, be quiet. I loved watching him act and I wish he would act again. Vietnam, he was brilliant. Um, Balon Chambers, a long way from home. I, I loved what he did in that. You animal bastards! You He was definitely getting into trouble as a young bloke. He looked at one point there like he was going to be the black sheep of the family, you know? Yeah, John was turning into a bit of a delinquent at one stage in his early years. You know, you asked me to cut myself off from my whole family. I can't make that decision. Oh, you hurt me, Glenn Sprague. So Johnny could have had a whole other life that would have been, you know, on Australian story for a different reason. And he didn't. He could have been a very different person. And that's what makes him, you know, such a legend in my mind, you know, because of the choices that he made and because of the way he was able to use creativity as um, a funnel to take him somewhere completely different. If a flame is to grow, there must be a glow. To open each door, there's a key. 
Well, John's mother, Mary Frances, was a superb jazz musician. And I did a bit of singing with her in Auckland, and we got together. Lips must insist. It was an unusual existence, I suppose, compared to what other people had. And I'd say, Mari, what's for breakfast? And she'd sit down to the piano and say, what would you like to hear? One and only you. My parents split up when I was, I think I was about two. There wasn't a lot of money to go around, a single mom and four kids and whatever. We had a, a stepfather called Lockie, he was crazy, kind of an alcoholic and, you know, just nuts. And then mum, I think it just melted down, it's too many kids and, you know, so she sort of took a break and we moved in with dad and chaos set in. Well, I tried to bring some stability. He wasn't very fond of authority. There hadn't been a lot of rules, you know? And my way out of that was to really muck up. You know, the cops were around a lot. I can remember on one occasion, I was in a shop at Crow's Nest, and I just happened to be looking out the window, and there is John with a friend breaking into a car right in front of my eyes. Oh, I think he was expelled from a few schools, John, I think, yeah. He was invited not to return. Call it what you will. I remember getting a letter saying, uh, next term, we don't expect John to return or something like that. <laughs> and so it was, they breathed a sigh of relief, as did John. And of course, I'm stuck with, what are we going to do with this kid? Then Glen Ian, which was the Rudolf Steiner school that my dad sent me to because he'd done his research and found out they don't expel anybody. I was actually expelled. That, that one I really was expelled from. By the time I was 16 or 17 years old, I mean, I was getting arrested and I was, you know, stealing motorbikes and, yeah, I, I was probably a week away from going to jail, which, frankly, was where a lot of my friends from the same period were going. I was definitely... Um, I had no hope, no real future, I had no nothing. Don't you think there's something cool about, as it's being announced, we're doing this stuff? The wipes come out. Well, that's, that's where Randall's got to know. So here we are, three days before Tropfest. The venue's looking fantastic. We're in good shape, we're rehearsing tomorrow. We had a little rain, not too worried. It actually made me feel a little bit better because it's been really beautiful weather this week and I thought, I don't know if I can believe the weather's going to hold for that long. So I do sometimes like a little shower a couple of days before, just to chill out, right? Maybe this way, Harper. I basically was on a path to nowhere, and I get a call out of the blue from a friend of the family's, from a friend of my dad's, Robin Gardner, and she had just recently started an acting agency. This is pretty good fun. Someone was producing a show called The Kid, and they asked Robin who they could cast in this role of the troubled teenager. And she knew a lot about our, our family and our background and so on, and, um, and suggested John. That was my thinking. And we've got, we've got the filmmakers tomorrow afternoon. And that was kind of the beginning of my acting career. I could have been here. OK. That's not my best thing. He was brilliant in that show. It was a young cast, largely, and he just was electrifying um, and, and completely at home on the stage. And suddenly I actually had something to do and something to feel good about. And that was completely what changed my life because I thought, wait a minute, I can put all this energy and all this creativity instead of into, you know, putting a teacher's car on the roof or prank calls or stealing a motorbike into this acting thing and get paid for it. So what are we going to do tonight? I'm going back to Alton's place. My agent called me and said, there's going to be a guy working on set today in a really small role. His name's John Polson. He's my best friend's son. And he's finding himself a little, little wayward, a little in and out of trouble right now. He was only about 17. She said, keep an eye on him and tell me what you think of him. Tell me if you think he's 
got some talent as an actor. Sorry, Guy. I uh, forgot to ask how you take your tea in the morning. As it comes. Why don't you? Piss off, will you? I remember reporting back to Robin Gardner. I think he's really talented and I think he's adorable. You know that is. From then on, he knew what his role in life was going to be. Jimmy. He was one of these people lucky enough to find his, me his medium early. <coughs> and see why I don't smoke. Yeah. <coughs> so I guess in my early to mid-twenties, obviously I was working in that world of acting, and you form a very strong bond with a lot of other actors because you've kind of been together. Uh, a lot of the people hanging around were just like bit part actors or struggling. Wow. Never in your wildest dreams could you imagine where everybody was going to end up. And of course, today, it's Naomi Watts and Nicole Kidman and um, um, Simon Baker. You know, people have really done incredibly well. We had a spare room and he needed a place to stay, so he said he would come and stay until he found the right place. <laughs> And I had a futon that was basically this thing was full of dust. And the very first night I'm staying in that room, you know, I've always had a little bit of asthma. But by probably six in the morning, I couldn't breathe anymore, period. I just thought it would go away. And probably about six, I realised it wasn't, it, it really wasn't going to go away. And I was, I was kind of going to die. Lo and behold, John is banging on my door. And he was like, no, me. You know, um, he could barely talk, and I just thought he was playing a practical joke. You know, this was our relationship. And I was, you know, of course, half asleep, and it, you know, didn't take more than a couple of seconds, but I, because uh, I saw the color or the lack of color in his face, and um, he needed me to call an ambulance. Yes, I was in the ambulance. And I was totally fucked, and it was not a fun feeling. I mean, I'd stopped breathing <clears throat> for about, <clears throat> they said later, eight minutes, which is kind of <sighs> problematic. He was in very, very, very bad shape, and it was scary, very scary. And Naomi, totally. I mean, there's not many people you can say, if it wasn't for that person, I'd be dead. Um, she's, she might be the only one. She wouldn't admit it now, but she spent the next two, three, four weeks visiting me every day, three times a day in hospital. And I recovered and got out of there. I didn't move back to that house. There was a bunch of us that would spend a lot of time at the Tropicana, drinking coffee, having lunch, whatever, connecting there, you know, in, a, in lunch breaks from theater rehearsals or whatever. Oh, it was endless sitting around, drinking coffee, waiting for the, the agent to ring. I get a job, I get a little bit of money, and then I'm out of work, you know, for months sometimes. So it was very frustrating. So I think for John it was, listen, if you want to work and you're sitting around moaning about how there's no work, get off your ass and go and make a film with a video camera or your mates from film school or your dad's Super 8 or whatever. 